Hello students, this is the help video part two, and it's actually part two for me because I did a 39 minute video the other day and something went wrong with the recording and none of the audio was recorded. Uh, the good news is I think I have better technical quality on this video. I spent two hours with the text from WebEx and trying to work out some of the technical stuff. So at least the sound quality, hopefully, will be a little bit better this time. So now in part two of your group project, you have to train salespeople. And there's a number of different elements of the process uh, for training. And I'll start with kind of the basic thing, which is product knowledge. So when the students come into the training program, you, they need to have the product knowledge. And I, I you know, refer to it as the base of the pyramid. It's a low-level skill. It's probably the lowest-level skill of all the things that you're going to train, but it's not unimportant. And in fact, it, 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 you know, if you can't build the base of the pyramid correctly, you, the rest of the pyramid is going to collapse. So you've got to have a solid base. If, if salespeople get technical questions they can't answer, they lose credibility. You know that I'll get back to you. I have to get back to you on that. Uh, uh, you know, you, once in a while, something arcane, but if you just clearly don't understand or know the products that you're selling, the different brands, that's going to look really bad, and it's, you know, you're going to lose credibility. Your sales reps are going to lose credibility when with their, with their customers, and it's going to be harder for them to close and harder for them to get the deals. Uh, it's the credit, you know, the that believability, trustability, you know, that kind of first step to the building of the trust is that the, the you know, the, the buyers or the owner managers of the retail operations that are going to carry your products, they want to feel like they can get the right answer from you about stuff, or, you know, from you, the rep, or from the rep about stuff. Uh, the other thing is that it helps enhance the kind of ability – to get the most out of the product. And, and I, you know, in, in Fred McCarris class, you probably talked about microeconomics, diminishing margin utility, the concept of utility and diminishing margin. You may remember diminishing margin utility. Utility is when, you know, when the final customer comes in and buys one of the products that we're a rep for from the retailer that's our customer. Get a certain amount of happiness from that purchase. And if the more the sales reps in the store, we can communicate to the store, and the, the sales reps in the store spend time with them, we can explain to them how to explain to the customer and how to get, you know, the right bow for somebody's height, strength, arm width, whatever uh, their, you know, intended use. Are they a hunter or are they just going to go out and shoot at targets? And, you know, get the right equipment for that person uh, and explain to them how to get the most out of it. And that's an important part of the selling process. In the old days, you know, we kind of as consumers expected that. We expected people to help. And now we kind of self-serve it. But the more the people who work in the store, and this is for your high-end type things, are able to uh, communicate, the more they know, the more our reps can communicate product knowledge to that sales rep in the store, the more time they spend with them, the more likely they are to recommend the product, likely that 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 clerk in the store or, or salesperson in the stores is likely to do a good job explaining to the customers and the customer gets the right product and they get the most utility or units of happiness out of it and everybody wins. Because in, in the end, just getting this stuff in the store doesn't is not a win for us. We got to get the stuff in the store that's the good stuff that the final consumer is going to want to buy. You know, that's for when you're talking about a company like BGDR, that's, you know, just getting it, pushing it into the store doesn't, it helps. I mean, if it's not in the store, the customer can't buy it, but we also need to do some things to get it to sell. So then the, so, so product knowledge, and just, it's, it's not unimportant, it is important, but it's not the most important thing. And honestly, most sales training programs, when y'all, this, I'm speaking to y'all because in a few weeks you're going to be executives. Many of you are already moving up the ladder. But if you get into this position as an executive where you're designing, analyzing, refining, whatever, the sales training program, just understand that there's a tendency to spend way too much of the sales training time and effort 
on product knowledge. I'm, you know, it's important. I'm, it's good. I'm for it, but it's not the most important thing, and it shouldn't be overemphasized. And it often is. Prospecting. Uh, prospecting is important, and I think if you you work on part three, which is your your process control, and you want to like you want to develop a system that rewards the salespeople for doing the things they, that we want them to do. BGDR as a company wants them to do. Prospecting is one of it. Uh, a lot of us, you know, sales reps can get by on it on uh, their existing customers, but but they should always be looking for new customers. There's always new customers coming online. There's always new businesses starting. Uh, there's always combinations, you know, somebody like, like all of a sudden Dan Mahoney, if his formula is a huge success, all of a sudden there's Mahoney's, you know, everywhere. I mean, there's a Mahoney's here, there's a Mahoney's there. So these uh, kind of franchise type sporting goods sellers, uh, that they, they get their concept working and all of a sudden, you know, they expand and they expand. There's always a, a new marina. Uh, there's a new uh, boat landing that's being built, and then somebody has to put a marina. If you've got a new boat landing, you put a new marina there. And there's always new places that they can go, new gun shops popping up left and right. Uh, I don't know if you noticed. Pretty soon, uh, some of your, I don't know if it's students or, or professors or both, but there are going to be people that can carry guns on campus. Uh, and we're getting ready for all that excitement so that if uh, – a bad person comes, there'll be lots of guns on campus to shoot that bad person. I guess that's the theory uh, behind all that. So prospects are important, and we need to reinforce it, and we need our process control, which is part three, and I talked about this a little bit. We need to have some mechanism for, for tracking and, and ensuring that our sales reps are engaged in prospecting. And uh, the, the, in a, it would be a little bit different. Now, a couple of the cases that we've had are bigger companies that have – complex products they have this kind of long pipeline sales where you got to go in you know you got to get them to notice you then there's some needs analysis that goes on our technical people get with their technical people and then we develop this kind of comprehensive proposal for product and and the back end the servers and other back end stuff and then maybe the 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 uh, servicing plan uh, tech support that goes with that and there's a lot of you know stuff involved for this, the, the chain for BGDR, the, the chain is fairly short. So the the pros, the actual part of the prospecting where you're you know you're you're creating infographics or we, or you're doing webinars or things like that doesn't ap apply. And I'm not saying that videos and social media can't be a help uh, for something like this, but but it's not. You know, we're gonna we go in. The customers there, they sell products that are in our category. We go and we call on them and we try to get them to carry our products and do the best we can to, you know, get products that are going to be work for their clientele and that they're going to sell. And, and, you know, we have an easy in with some of the products, you know, the Z-Man lures and the Rubbermaid products and things like that. We have an easy in with that. So we can usually get in and get something in the door at almost every place we go to, and then it's a matter of, you know, stepping them up to this, you know, moving them over to that, uh, those kind of things. So the, the sales reps need to identify the people with the needs. They need to find out who it is that makes the decision, who is the main buyer, who is the main person that makes a decision on what it is that you're going to carry. Uh, it, you know, we meet – we have a presence at trade shows and things like that. And when we do the trade shows, you know, the buyers come in from all over. We gather the cards. We gather their contact information. You have a couple free giveaways in order to do that. But then our sales reps need to follow up on that. So, you know, some sort of systematic approach to processing, prospecting, processing, prospecting is what we need to teach the sales reps. Uh, the approach is really important, and particularly – I guess a, a sales rep that's in an existing territory, he may not have that many new missionary calls. You know, once a week, a couple times a week, maybe he might uh, actively prospect. But a lot of these reps, these are in neglected territories, and they're, the reps are going to be new. So they're going to be meeting a lot of people for the first time. And when you're on that kind of missionary meet people for the first time, it's very important that you have the right approach. And what you want is a sales rep, and this is something to look for in hiring, that has that kind of positive feeling. We would say in my era, 
and I'm a little bit old with you, somebody that had that karma, you know, that positive or the aura, that positive, you know, they just kind of emanated positivity. And we know people that kind of emanate negativity and the people that emanate positivity. Many students are scared of my best friend. Well, I don't want to say, but he's a marketing professor here. And he just has a, a little bit of a severe countenance. And he's actually the nicest guy in the world, and he's actually way more like outgoing. I'm introverted. He's extroverted. You know, he's way more outgoing, friendly. He's very good at carrying a conversation on with just about anybody. But when you first see him, the students see him there, they're a little bit afraid. You know, he's got that kind of severe look to him. Uh, so we want salespeople that, that do that. We want the salesperson to learn a method of generating interest in the product, whatever brand or product it is that they're calling on the customer for, right away. Some sort of way, some sort of standardized introduction that works for that salesperson. And it's different kind of for different people, like a, a really large man, you know, like a linebacker looking guy. They say, you know, never wear a blue pinstripe suit if you're like over six feet tall and you're really muscular, you know, 6'2", six 6'3", six really muscular. you got to be careful about overpowering people. And if you're smaller, you need to be careful about not being treated seriously so you, you know, can be a little bit more aggressive and a little bit stronger. Women, they teach, I know because I have asked many of my students who have gone, you know, gone into sales careers, do they teach, how do, what do they say to you about the handshake? They tell you to shake, you know, the kind of firm, strong handshake that we men were taught as sales reps, and that was kind of the first disqualifier when you go to a job interview. Remember that. Go to a job interview for anything related to sales, management, whatever. The handshake's got to be right. It's got to be the manly style handshake. And they actually teach women it's even more important to have a firm, strong, aggressive, kind of confident handshake. And a lot of this goes back to the buyers feel com who the buyers feel comfortable with. Now, a man that's like 6'4", that wants to go up and maybe not, you know, maybe a little softer. You might, you know, so there's, what works for different people is a little bit different. But whatever makes the, the customers feel comfortable. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we don't, you know, the BGGR doesn't have its sales reps go in in suits. You, do, you know, you go in dressed in what a sportsman will wear, nice, clean, you know, with a collar, kind of cotton, nice cotton shirt, but it, it shows you're a sportsman uh, as opposed to a suit. And so, the, you know, the idea is that the, the sales rep should be able to make the buyer feel comfortable. And this is something to pay attention to in the interview process as well. Are they the kind of person that, that, that's, that other people want to be friends with and they want to have that thing? I use the example of uh, Bubba in uh, Forrest Gump. And when you first meet Bubba, the director does a really good job. The Forrest Gump's getting on the bus to go to the military, and Bubba's sitting there, and everybody's afraid to sit next to him. No, he looks really mean, and he looks up, and he's got that, you know, his lips is twisted a little bit, and he looks really tough and mean, and Forrest said, can I sit here? Is anybody sitting here? Oh, no, go on, have, you know. It turned out to be the sweetest, nicest guy in the world. He saved everybody's life in the war, and you know, became the Bubba Gump, half of Bubba Gump for his mom, half of Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. But that initial look was scary. And you want people that have the opposite initial look. The, the initial, gosh, I'd like to be friends with this person. This is like a good guy. I want to be friends with this kind of person. Uh, and they make other people feel comfortable around them. So that all of that is something that needs to be taught in the approach. And it's a kind of psychological thing. And you need somebody that's good at kind of reading people and other things to do that kind of training. A presentation is the most important to me, the understanding how to present the products and the process of a presentation uh, in, in like a company like Northwestern Mutual just loves to hire our salespeople because, you know, well, they'll sell at least a few policies to their family and they don't really pay, they just get paid, you know, a draw on their commissions and it almost always generates the money. So they love to hire our, but they're, they, one thing I'll say about Northwestern Mutual, they're really good at training. You know, if you want to go into uh, life insurance, to me, is a, a grind. Uh, you know, people that make a living at it have a personality that's very different from mine, and they're able to do it, and I, I you know, more power to them. But 
uh, you know, that kind of B2C, every human contact is a potential customer type of thing is, is just not, I mean, it's, it's not me, but that, but Northwestern Mutual is a really good job training. They've got a system, you know, they've got everything planned. They've got their thousand questions, you know, all the quest things to find out about the customer, personal stuff like, you you know, alimony, child support, uh, you know, what is your mortgage, all of these questions that they need to ask you in, in order to find out what type of policy that they be best for you. And uh, they 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 even have like pauses. They you know times when they're what they're trying to do is elicit an objection from you to you know want you to get more involved and interactive in the process and to ask them questions. So the 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 new sales reps, the rookies, should not go in with a shoot from the hip. Okay, I'm gonna here's the product. What do you think? No, they need to have a planned approach. They need to understand the the key selling factors, benefits of of the product vis-a-vis -vis its competitors or our competitors, you know, the other rep companies that are representing competing products. They need to know the advantages of those kinds of things, the, of the products, uh, all of the different things that are going to be used to overcome potential objections. Now, your sales rep has got to be very heavily involved in my I mean, your sales manager has got to be very heavily involved in training the sales rep, people that have actually sold the product, because for one thing, they know kind of, you know, what the objections are. They know when it's best to elicit an objection. They know what things you need to do in the middle, uh, what types of signals you get to do your first close, uh, all the things that you need to explain to the customer, and then the ways of, of you know, getting through whatever doubts uh, and everything that the customer might have to the finish line. I think it's important if you, you know, for example, in a Northwestern Mutual may have a 10 second pause. And the reason for the pause is that they want the customer to say something. You know, they want the customer really to raise an objection. And then that'll give them another clue as to what it is, what are the things that we need to know in order to get the customer past their hesitancy and to go ahead and purchase a policy. And so there's a reason for the 10-second pause. If you don't explain the reason for the pause, the salesperson is not going to know, understand, just it doesn't make sense to them. So all of the steps, you know, should break down the presentation, explain why we do this, why we, why we don't tell all of the benefits of the product right away. We just hit a couple of the highlights, and we save a couple of things but for this objection or this objection, this objection, this objection. Like for example, when you're selling in a B2B situation, the issue is not, you know, am I going to buy it? Am I going to like it? Is are my customers going to be interested in it? I don't know. My customers may not have ever heard of this product. Well, we're going to do we. That's good. And I actually. This company knows that. The company we represent knows that. And that's why they're going to do 100% co-ops with y'all, up to $300, 100% co-ops. And you have somebody that's in a small town, you know, Elizabethan or, you know, gun shop or sporting goods store, and he can get a $300 co-op, 100% co-op. That's a big deal to him. He can go out and get $300 worth of advertising as long as he features that his, his store is carrying that brand. And it's highlighted, and it's like three inches. It's you know, at least, and they very very specific on how many inches and how big the logo has to be, and what font you use, and all kind of silly stuff like that. But at 100% co-op for $300, somebody in Hampton, Elizabeth, and Mountain City, Rogersville, that's a big deal to them. So. The, the, you might know you want to save that in, in a lot of cases in a presentation system. Some of the big guns are saved for the end. You know, if you carry, look, if you carry Daiwa, we've got $300, up to $300, 100% co-ops, so that you can educate your customer about the product. Uh, and so that, that presentation system, and of course it's got some product knowledge in it, and it's got, but it should have a kind of start, it should, you should reach a plateau. You should you should have some points in there where you're it's interactive, so that the customer can raise objections or say what they need to say. Then at the end, you know you you need to have a couple of things to overcome those final objections, and then you need to close. So now, as part of the 
presentation process, you're going to get objections. And an objection is anything which stops the normal flow of the sales process. You know, the sales goes in, here's the product, here's what it does, here's the, the, the. any questions, challenge, statement. It can even be some sort of negative body language, like, what, I've heard all this before. Or, like, I don't believe that. You know, that neg that I don't believe it body language, or I'm, you know, I'm just tired of listening to salesman body language. Uh, all of those things are objections. It could be a statement, a challenge, anything. And objections are actually not a bad thing. And that's a, something that's a, a little bit, for people, if you've not worked in sales or not worked in marketing, you, you know, it's, hard. it's the opposite. It's counterintuitive to what you would think it was. But this, the objection is something that's additional information about the way the customer is thinking, one extra thing you need to know in order to, to get the deal down in order to understand what uh, you need to know in order to get the customer to carry the product. And so they're not bad. And the sales managers have to help with this. Some of the objections can be very product specific. I carry this brand, nobody's asking for this brand. Uh, I, you know, I've used this and I've used this and I don't like your brand, I like this brand. So that's why I carry that brand. And you've got to have a way to overcome those objections. Uh, it can also be objections to things like money. Uh, I, you know, I just don't have any open to buy, particularly you're calling on existing, uh, you know, buyers for chains and stuff. I don't have any open to buy in that category. And that's why, you know, you you, you go into certain stores, and somebody could always got the same stuff, the same brands, and never improve, achieve, some kind of new thing comes out, they don't have it. Uh, and the, 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 the buyers don't have extra money to buy. They've been given a, okay, we're going to buy exactly what we bought last year. No new, uh, there may be objections to shelf space. Where am I going to put it? I don't have any room. I'm already full. I mean, I'm jammed to the max with product. I'm sorry here. I'm going to have to take a, a, a drink of my fruit beverage. Sorry about that. I wish I could edit that out, but I can't. So the, the, the objections a sales manager should practice. Uh, you should, you know, form kind of informal dyads and go through some role plays. Now, of course, as part of your uh, what you're required to do, I want you to write a role play, and I believe I said I had four objections. So you'll need to know a couple different techniques for overcoming the objections. Uh, first technique, direct denial. If somebody says something, you say it, it's, but it, it's it, uh, not a valid objection. It's invalid. It's not factually correct, and you can explain to them the evidence that you have that shows that, it, that that's not factually correct, that actually this product is rated higher than that product on Amazon or, or you know, uh, Consumer Reports. This product's rated higher than this one. They said it isn't, so you can show it to them, prove it to them. Uh, direct denial is a little bit like saying, no, you're wrong, you stupid idiot. So the direct denials, I, I always caution my uh, students, don't use it very often. Don't use it unless you have to. Only use it if it's factually invalid and you have the evidence to dispute it, to, to show that that's wrong. Uh, somebody says nobody uses Daiwa. Well, I, you know, I've got, you know, we sell for Daiwa and their their sales are up. I mean, we you know their their sales are uh, have been up every year for ten years, and I've got a chart to show it. So uh, only in certain circumstances, indirect denial is much better. Yes, which is basically yes, I understand how you feel, but that's not correct. But here's the uh oh. I hope this is still working. Maybe. So I hope the audio is still working here. What's going on? Okay, I guess the audio, sorry about that. So that's a glitch at whatever time. I'm sorry about that. Okay, so the next one, indirect denial, yes, but. 
yes, that I understand why you would say that, but that's not actually correct. Uh, another one is feel, felt, found. Uh, feel, felt, found is, you know, different sales people had different things that work for them. Feel, felt, found always worked for me. Yes, I, I, it's a kind of special form of the indirect denial, if you will. Uh, I understand, yes, I, I understand how you feel. Other people have felt the same way, but they have found, so, you know, yes, like say this is an objection to the Z, the Z man swim baits as opposed to golfs. Uh, yes, I understand how you feel. I, you know, I've had other people say the same thing to me, but, you know, the Z mans stay on the jig head and they don't come off and the you can you know they're much less likely to bit get their tail bitten off so they actually last a lot longer than any of the other swim baits and that's why so many of the guys you see in the fishing tournaments are fishing their number one you know swim bait is is a z-man fuel fell fell uh an, an, an other and the probably the best of the strongest and so i really definitely want you to teach this one uh, is the third-party testimony. So you're waiting for a time when somebody says that um, something is in, you know, they, well, for example, somebody says, you know, I just haven't had anybody asking for that product. I just don't think it'll sell here. And that's a tough objection. You know, the retailer, he knows his own customers, doesn't think the product will sell. Well, you need to have somebody that does carry the product and it is selling really well. Somebody in a similar situation is selling the product and it's doing really well for him. Uh, and so you have somebody that says, well, I don't, you know, I don't think that die, I just don't have any demand for the die were reels. You know, we uh, sell Shimano and Fluger and uh, the Zebco, the different Quantums and Zebcos and stuff. And we've done pretty well with that. Stop. Okay, so you know you can start it off like a direct an indirect denial. Uh, you know Bob DeConje in uh, Thibodeau said the same thing at his store in Thibodeau, but he's found since he started carrying the Daiwa reels that a lot of your offshore fishermen in particular are going in there looking to him for their big heavy duty rigs. And he wants, you know, they, but he's also selling a lot of spinning reels, Daiwa spinning reels and stuff. He's had a lot of success with that. Well, you know, if it's, a, let's say, a Dan Mahoney type guy from here, and he knows the people in Thibodeau, if you were in Louisiana, he knows the people in Thibodeau, he knows DeConge. Uh, and so he, you know, he, he can talk to them, he knows what they're doing, he knows they're in a similar situation. So the third party testimonial is a reference to somebody that's in that's using the product and had good success with it. That's why it's really important for the new rookie sales reps to get to be given some third party testimonials by Joe English or some of the other sales reps. So if I get this objection, you know, I, they're ready. Somebody, even if it's not in your his territory, the new rookie rep's territory, one of the existing rep's territory that can help him with that type of objection. Uh, and that's one of the reasons also I like for the, the role plays and I like for them to work with a sales manager or somebody that's actually been there and done that, you know, that has experience and knows what types of uh objections are liable to come up. So I gave you four there. Feel free to look up uh, others uh, if you want to. Look up other objection overcoming techniques. I think I taught about 10 in my sales class. And uh, so and that will also be something that you need to incorporate into the um, uh, your role play. I would say this. You, if your strongest techniques, objection overcoming techniques, are the fear felt found and the third party testimonial. Use those for the most important objections. Don't use those for a trivial, trivial or un, relatively unimportant objection. Use those for the most important objections. Okay, the next step is the salesperson has to close. And there is the thing in the handout or in your assignment about the time on a rule and I'll start that. Well, no, I won't do that first. Explain why closing is so important first. Why closing is good. And you watch uh, watch the movie. It's definitely not safe for work. 
uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, it's G L E N G A R Y, Glenn Gary, won a bunch of David Mame, won a bunch of Academy Awards. Uh, there's a scene from Alec Baldwin that he reprised on Saturday Night Live and screwed up. Uh, so he, uh, you know, he did a, but he's famous for that scene. All of Alec Baldwin's, you know, probably won numerous awards. I can't think of actually him winning an Academy Award or anything like that, but he probably has. But uh, I think Kevin Spacey won an Academy Award for that movie. And I, I it's really, it's a tough, hard-nosed, with lots of cursing type of real-world sales scenario. Uh, Glenn Gary, Glenn Roth, but they, they go through the ABCs, and Alec Baldwin's soliloquy, you bring Alec Baldwin in to harangue the new rec- you know, recruits that aren't selling very well. Uh, ABC always be closing, and, and the closing's good, closing's important, people that can't close, that have fear of closing disease are in trouble. So explain why the closing is so important, and the, and the, the answer to that question, my, I answer my own question, is that, that the closing gets you closer to discovering what it is that you need to get to deal. So if you close, two things can happen. They can say, shake your hand and say, yeah, we have a deal. Or, or they can say, well, you know, I need to know about this. So both of those are good. I mean, saying I want, yeah, closing the deal, yeah, we got a deal. That's great. If they don't, if you don't, they have an objection, and, and they typically will raise an objection, give you a reason why they don't want to do the deal now. Well, that's good, too, and that's why, you know, a lot of times it takes three to five closes. Even, you know, I had students who work at, like, Rainbow Vacuum, selling Rainbow Vacuum Cleaners or Vector Marketing, or they'll say you need five closes before you get the deal. And it was kind of the standard. So it's important to have a repertoire of closes, and it's important that the, the sales manager you know, explain the techniques and, and kind of when to give this close and when to give that close. Now, a couple of different closes here. Uh, a, 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 an experienced rep calling on an existing customer would almost always use as their first close an implied consent close. And the way that works is that the sales rep is, <coughs> sorry, I, will, I need to have a better editing. Abilities. Uh, so the sales rep is in there with the customer. They're kind of writing stuff down on an order pad. And the sale, you know, I need more of these. What about this? I mean, I think this, no, the customer doesn't want that. Well, we might give it a second try and say, okay, that's okay. You write down this. We need some more of this. We need to, you know, redo this. And then at the end, he says, okay, just authorize your signature. And I, I don't get it myself, or I don't subscribe to this myself. But there's a lot of people out in the sales business who never want, don't use the word sign. You know, give me your initials or authorize your signature, something, not, uh, anything other than sign. Because I guess it has bad connotation to signing a life so. But at the end, just as soon as he's going to buy, gets everything down and just gives them the order form initially. You know, authorize your signature, and then that's how they close. Now the, the you know, customer never said, well, yeah, I definitely want to buy this. or def- def-. They just kind of, okay, well, I got this. I, I put this stuff in. I, I saw you need, you know, you're almost out of this. We need this. We need to, re- you know. And then that's the implied consent close is just to give it to them and sign. If you're calling on somebody on a missionary call, like your your new reps, the, the kind of standard first close would be a summary and agreement close, uh, where you use what's called a trial close. Uh, a series of trial closes to get them used to kind of saying yeah and, and you figure out what they will agree to and what they won't agree to. And then at the end, you can come back with one of your other closes that I'll give you in a minute. So the summary and agreement technique involves a series of trial closes. A trial close, as opposed to like just a regular close or a close, is when you ask for a commitment to something short of your goal. So in, in a long-chain sales situation like at Eastman, they, their initial goal might be to just be given permission to do a needs analysis or one of these software companies that sells these kind of software solutions to hospital systems. Their goal might be just to get in there and and be allowed to do a needs analysis. Our te- let's get our technical people get with your technical people, and then we'll see if we can't work out some kind of deal uh, and see if we can't develop a solution. And they get together, and, we, and then there's a – you know, the proposal that's made and presented and 
uh, to the, the, you know, the people that make the, the, the key decisions, and that's how that process works. Now, in, in uh, BGDR's case, it's almost always they're going to be a, just the, the close is going to be trying to get a deal, sell the product, get their degree to order the product. It's not going to be a lot of needs analysis or kind of long term. We got to get to this step. We got to get to this step. And we, you know, close in them on like just allowing you to make the presentation to whoever the main sign off. Every, you know, on everything bean counter is. You know, we got to get got to agree to let us present our proposal to the team, including the big man that actually writes the checks. Uh, and then if you, you'll do that, we'll, we'll go ahead with the needs analysis. So the uh, trial close, and, and, you know, like if you're, like, looking for a car, it might be on color. Uh, it might be, you know, on, you know, you're looking at automatics and you're looking at five, you know, stick shifts. Is it, it you know, make sure that there's not a preference for one over the other or the type of car that you want or it's got to, I don't know, it's got to have a hitch on it or it's got to be able to be able to put a hitch on it. It's got to be able to haul. For, you know, I got a boat and it's 4,000 pounds. So if I buy a pickup truck, it's it's got to be able to haul. That doesn't sound right. 4,000 pounds for a boat. It's got to be more than that. Anyway, it's got to be able to haul 4,000 pounds worth of stuff. That's a minimum. But it doesn't, you know. So you asking the customer to make a commitment about the clothes or the type of haul, you know, anything, the color of the car, or anything like that. That would be examples of trial closes. So you're in a situation where somebody's selling a financial instrument said, look, if I can, sh like a life insurance policy, a financial instrument, if I can show you a way that you can accumulate, a, you know, $100,000 at retirement, would you be interested? Well, I mean, uh, yes. I mean, uh, of course, we know you you all have MBAs, you're getting MBAs. We all know that the, the $100,000 we're going to get is really our own money kind of given back to us at a very low interest rate. You know, if we get like a whole life, $100,000 whole life policy, very, very low interest rate, uh, earnings rate, and they're kind of giving us our own money back at the end if we don't die instead of just keeping it from us. Uh, you know, that's the difference between whole life and term. So we know that, but but the the, the initial trial closes, would you be interested in getting up and, and finding a way that you can accumulate $100,000 retirement? Well, yeah. Be interested in. And most people would say yes. So the, the summary and agreement technique starts off with a number of closes that are very easy to say yes to, hard to say no to, and get progressively a little bit closer to the goal. And then it gives you an idea, the sales rep an idea, what it is that they need to know in order to get that get that deal. Uh, the uh, A couple of other closing techniques, a so bear trap close. Uh, it's also, you'll see if you look this up on the web, we may call it uh, alternatives, bear trap alternatives close. You know, big alternative, small alternative. Uh, typically, in this field, you'd be a kind of you could you could go with either one, but I think a big alternative close would be uh, more standard than a small alternative close. Although I'm, I, I might not be right about that, but anyway, in a bear trap close, you give the customer two choices: to buy or to buy, buy or buy. So you know, look, I've explained to you, and, and like you trying to sell life insurance, uh, liability insurance. Because look, I've explained to you the, the benefits of the, the five million dollar policy, but I know you said you for the you know, what you're doing, you, you feel like a million's enough. It's your turn. You want to go with the million dollar contract, you want to go with the five. Now the the customer there, the person in front of you may not have even agreed that they're gonna buy insurance from you. That they're gonna they're may they may want to go get quotes from three other places about their business liability insurance. But you don't, you know, your choice is to buy or to buy. If the customer doesn't buy, they have to kind of back out and not even answer the question. So that's a that's a bear trap close. Uh, hook close, which uh, you probably on the internet would we, you might hear it called a if I would you. Uh, if I can do this, would you buy the product? If I can get, look, if I can get a really nice co-op for you. 100% co-op up to, say, $200, would you carry the product? If I can get you an extra sample that you can show customers and allow them to use, uh, would you carry the product? A free sample. You know, sometimes you have, you know, big expensive things that cost like $1,000. A free sample for a retail store is a big deal for them. That's like getting something for free. So if I would you, that's the uh, hook close. Uh, there's also the direct close. It's where you just go up and you, you offer your hand, do we have a deal? 
you get a buying signal, direct close might be your second close, third close, uh, after the implied consent or something, but do we have a deal? And uh, it's a very, definitely very good close. You are free to, I think I teach 11 closes in my uh, sales class. You're free to look stuff up on the uh, internet and uh, things. But I think I said I wanted to have at least three closes in your role play so they can't go for the first close. The, the buyer, you know, has to have an objection the first close, has to have an object, maybe a little bit closer, objection in the second close, and then the third close. So the, on that, in that uh, role play, as you're you're teaching, you know, make sure you got your four objections, and then you've got a couple closes, and then you've got objections that come out of the closes because they don't buy right away. And then on the third close, you can go ahead and let the customer say yes. So now in your role play, I want you to make sure that you emphasize this time honor rule that I referenced earlier. Okay, here it is: the time honor rule. It is whoever blinks first loses. Whoever blinks first loses, and that's not good consultative relationship marketing type of language, but that's kind of the rule. So, and you, there's a scene in Glen Gary, Glen Ross, where uh, one of the characters is explaining, you know, this sales call that he had, and he's given the story. And the, the here, but here's what the time on a rule means. If you go in and you're on your third close and you got a direct close, and it's something as simple as, do we have a deal? And out goes your hand. Now, once you have that, do we have a deal? The salesperson must not pull their hand back. No. You must, the salesperson must not say anything. No. The salesperson must not do their eyes like this. They must not even blink. It has to be, do we have a deal? And that's about as long as I can go without blinking, but that's the thing. Now, the rookie, even experienced salesperson, what is con what's going through your head in this is, you know, I told them A and B, but I just didn't tell them about C. And so the tendency to want to, wait, before you decide, let me tell you one more thing. No. If it's wait before you decide, let me tell you one more No. You can't do that. You've lost. Uh, I've told them X and Y, but I didn't tell them Z. You know, it's just so, such a strong urge. And the silence that occurs when do we have a deal? That pregnant silence, it's, it's, it's like screams at you, and you want to do anything, say anything, pull your hand back. You, just, you must not. So the sales reps in the, in the uh, training program, let's make sure that you get in your script that the, the customer waits on that final close waits and kind of waits and kind of waits and the sales rep does not pull their hand back they don't say anything they don't blink they wait right there hand out ready to go holding the pen for them to sign if it's implied consent close whatever it is they don't blink they don't pull back they don't say anything. so that's the time article. that is it for the part two overly long I'm afraid uh, and I but I hope that this video has better technical quality than uh, the one that I had to redo uh, from last week and good luck with uh, your assignment and I hope you all enjoy it and learn a lot